Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Egg Whisperer. I'm very fired up about sharing with you some of my personal mantras today. I woke up this morning and I said, I'm gonna carpe the F out of this DM. <laughs> and so um, I'm totally serious. That's how I wake up. I'm like, what's my mantra today? And carpe diem is one of them. And I'm not just gonna carpe the DM, I'm gonna carpe the S out of the DM. And I'm just watching my language because I just feel like some people might be offended by maybe the word that I was going to insert between carpe and diem. So there's that. So thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to start answering your questions right now. I'm going to add a little bit of humor, but at the beginning, I'm just going to tell you guys that this is for your education, for your information, and maybe sometimes for your entertainment. And maybe a little bit, you might feel embarrassed for me, just a little bit. My sister says she's embarrassed for me all the time and that's okay. So when you guys hear the stuff that I'm talking about on the show, it's just a way for you guys to feel more informed so you can ask your own doctor questions so you can go in with a list and so you feel like you're part of the process and not out of control and not part of the process that you're going through. So let's start answering some questions. So we have a question from North Texas. This is Jesse's question and Jesse says, I am 31 years old with PCOS, one failed chemical pregnancy. I did an endometrial biopsy and everything was normal. Second transfer ended in a chemical as well. What do I do now? I have five PGS tested embryos left. Would an ERA be helpful? I feel lost in my journey at this point. Everything seems perfect each transfer. Lining was trilaminar and looks beautiful. Please give me any advice. So Jenny, uh, Jesse, first of all, I'm really sorry for all that you've been through. It's so hard because you feel like you're told, and certainly like I'm in the situation too with patients where I'm like, I really feel like IVF is gonna be the solution and it's going to help you. And then you do IVF and it doesn't and you end up with two biochemical pregnancies. So I've certainly been there before with my patients and I'll tell you what I would do if you were my patient. Number one, look at the fallopian tubes. Let's make sure that there isn't a hydrocell pinks or a reason why the embryos could be floating up into the tubes and getting stuck there. Number two, has your doctor ruled out a uterine septum? Sometimes a uterine septum can cause issues like this. And HSG can also help you look at the uterine cavity as well. So ask your doctor, have you ruled out a hydrocell pinks? Have you ruled out a tubal issue? Have you ruled out a uterine septum? And then the other thing that can also cause issues would be endometriosis and or adenomyosis. So you can actually use those terms and ask your doctor, have you ruled out these two things for me? So you mentioned a test called the ERA test, and I don't know that that's a bad idea at all. I actually think that's quite a good one. You can run yourself through a dummy cycle or a mock cycle and actually do both tests, both the ERA and a test for endometriosis, and that's the Receptiva DX test. So you can do both of them. The other thing that I would consider doing is autoimmune testing to make sure you don't have, let's say, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, rule out lupus anticoagulant. I know some of this stuff is probably not gonna play a role in most people's situations, but see if you're positive for like factor five Leiden or prothrombin gene. Ask your doctor if a blood thinner like Lovenox would be something important for you to consider doing. And then you guys always know my mantra, right? Aside from carpe the F out of the DM, have you healed my PCOS? Diagnosis before treatment is what I'm referring to. So I think it's really important for you to know why you're doing IVF in the first place. Why? And make sure you've designed your IVF protocol and your embryo transfer preparation all around that why. So when you're transferring, you know everything that you need to know before you transfer to give yourself the best chance of pregnancy. And that's the hardest thing. Sometimes when you do a transfer, you find out that things aren't going to work out and it really sucks. But if you kind of break things down in this way with the egg whisper diet, then you might have a little bit more information about how to transfer the next time. So I really hope, Jesse, that all this information is helpful for you. I just came out of my IVF class, so I feel like I'm uh, more of a, I'm a little more chatty tonight. Um, this next question comes from Tara. Tara's from Los Angeles, and Tara says this, I started IVF for insurance reasons. As I was 37 years old, with no known issues, never tried to conceive, I did two egg retrievals and the doctor said that I needed endometriosis surgery. The uterus was covered in endometriosis near the rectum, pouch of Douglas. Ovaries and tubes were fine though, but the surgeon suspected adenomyosis from looking at my uterus. After they did the retrieval, they said my results were amazing. Sperm checked out, it was good for me, no blood clotting, thyroid good, uterus checked recently and looks good. I also did the ERA with the receptiva test and uh, the um, EFT test from Yale looking for adeno and inflammation. 
My question is for this next round. Do we keep the same protocol or should I do the protocol with Lupron or antihistamines, aspirin, and Lovenox? Do you think a medicated cycle might be better than a natural cycle? Does it have a higher chance of working? Third question. I have a, um, let's see. Oh, I have an embryo that is BC quality, female, from my first cycle before endosurgery, and then a BB girl from this last round that was marked as a 0 PN, meaning at first it looked like an abnormally fertilized embryo on day one, but went on to be a day five PGS tested normal. We want to try for a girl. Would you go for another retrieval or use what I have? Thank you. Your care and heart for women going through IVF makes such an impact. I felt so lost, but your information has kept me in control and able to advocate for myself. I just don't know what the best next step is for this next cycle. Okay, so Tara, here's the deal. It sounds like, let me see here, let me see here. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I can't tell if you've done a transfer yet or not, but my suggestion is embryo diamonds. You guys all know what that means. So that is looking at the day that your embryo was frozen or tested, the implantation rate per embryo, whether it was abnormal, normal mosaic, get all the official reports, look at the sperm on the day of the retrieval, and then ask, are these embryos going to help me make my dreams come true? You have a dream. <laughs> I know I should be having a mic. You have a dream and your dream is my priority. And who am I to say that you should not work so hard to have a female embryo? If that's your goal, you get one life to live. Who am I to judge? That's my perspective. You have these two embryos, you have a 5BB and a BC. My suggestion is to perhaps consider transferring the BB first. And if that doesn't work, consider transferring the next one or transfer both together or consider doing another cycle depending on what your full history is to get yet another chance at a female embryo. It just depends on, you know, um, the things that I just mentioned in embryodiamonds.com for those of you who want to go to that website. The other questions you ask, Lupron injections, antihistamines, aspirin, Lovenox, I would say yes. And then a medicated cycle might be better than a natural cycle. You know, since you shared with me that you had your uterus covered in endometriosis, it's possible that a medicated cycle could still be good. I add Femera throughout my medicated cycles up until progesterone start. But in general, if you have maybe um, really sensitive endometriosis, and what I mean by that, there's some patients who just, you can actually see endometriosis come back right away. Perhaps a natural cycle would be better. But I would also suggest maybe doing um, not just subcutaneous Lupron, but maybe depo Lupron before you transfer and then ask your doctor, is there a chance that I could have adenomyosis? Have you ruled that out for me? Okay, thank you for that question. This next question comes from Caroline and Caroline says, um, she's from New Hampshire. I'm 31, AMH of 0.83, follicle count of 15, trying to conceive for two years with four natural chemicals all under five weeks. We just had our first egg retrieval after 10 days on 150 of Munipure, 300 of Folliston with Yanarelic starting on day six and a trigger with Avadril. One day before my trigger, my estrogen was 1,212 with 13 follicles ranging 11 to 21. My doctor expected eight to 10 eggs and 70 of these to fertilize. We only got seven mature eggs and two fertilized. I'm heartbroken, waiting to find out how many will make it to blastocyst. We've done the tushy check. My husband's sperm was done a couple months ago. His count was 101 million. Motility, 54%. Morphology, 26%. I'm already looking to our next IVF cycle. How many cycles will we need to have two kids? And are there any medications you would add? I'm taking all the supplements and have been four months. Okay, Caroline, here's the deal. We have four natural biochemicals that you shared with me, right? And we have an AMH that's slightly low, but not terribly low by any means. And then we have a situation where we have a really low fertilization rate. Two fertilized eggs out of seven mature. Here's what I'm thinking. This could be egg quality driven, but it could also be sperm quality driven. When you have biochemicals, and any pregnancy at all before your IVF, I always say, let's learn as much as we can from those pregnancies so that we can take those lessons and apply it to how we design and plan your IVF cycle. What I mean by that is this. When you've had biochemicals, it could be from one of a couple of reasons. Number one, is there perhaps endometriosis? 
Endometriosis can affect the fallopian tubes. It can cause fallopian tube blockage. It can also cause your egg quality to be lower. It can cause lower mature eggs as well. But the other thing that biochemicals that I'm thinking of, chromosome issues, is it possible that you or your husband has a balanced translocation? So a translocation can result in a situation where you have a lot of mature eggs, not necessarily a lot, but you can have either the same number you expected or you can actually have less mature eggs, but you can have a really much lower fertilization rate just because of genetic abnormalities in the eggs that result in less fertilization. So I think those are important tests for you guys to do, a chromosome analysis for both you and your husband. And I think it's really hard to answer the question of how many embryos we'll need in order to have two kids until we actually know everything in your embryo diamonds. The day your embryo was frozen, the implantation rate, which embryos were normal, and then you'll have to ask those questions and answer them with your doctor. What do I want? And it's two kids, what will it take? And it sounds like you're ready to do another IVF cycle and it might take more cycles. And are you willing to do it? And it sounds like you're willing to do it. So let's learn a little bit more about yourself. Do the chromosome testing that I just mentioned, and then make sure you've looked at, and it sounds like you've done everything already, and then also consider doing sperm DNA fragmentation testing if let's say the chromosome testing comes back good. And then consider adding a technology in the lab like Zymot or Pixie. See if your doctor thinks that that would help. And then in cases of really low fertilization, one thing that I've found to be helpful over the years is something called calcium activation. So it sounds really fancy and it's actually quite fancy, but you have to be with a lab that has done it before. Obviously, we don't want to harm eggs or anything like that. So if you're asking people to do things just because I'm saying it on this show and th they have no experience with it, that's not necessarily the best situation. So it's a good idea to talk to people and say, um, would it be possible for you to consider calcium activation in my IVF case? Would that be helpful? What is your experience with it and what do you think? So in my experience, patients who have a very low fertilization rate, when you have a really good number of mature eggs, sometimes calcium activation can help. So ask your doctor as well. We want you to have more fertilized eggs next time. This question comes from Victoria in California. Victoria says, I'm 41 years old. My AMH is 0 0.01. My FSH is 25. I have endometriosis and I got pregnant at 38 with donor eggs and I have a beautiful daughter and I did transfers for our other two donor, em donor egg embryos last year and neither of them worked. We're all out of embryos. We want a sibling for her, but going the donor route again feels so overwhelming financially and emotionally. Do you think I have a chance at mini IVF with a day three transfer or am I crazy for even considering? So Victoria, you're not crazy for considering it. The likelihood of finding a good egg at 41 with an AMH of 0 0.01 is probably around 2%. Is it zero? No. But if you think about the amount of expense and the time that you're gonna put into doing that, for such a low chance, you might as well just save your money and wait a little bit longer and then go back to donor egg IVF. There's so many awesome, awesome banks out there and they have great financial packages for people now. You can finance the process also. So my thinking is rather than spending money that 98% of the time won't help you reach your goals, how about save some money over time and just wait a little bit longer and find an egg bank with an egg donor that you feel a really good connection with and you can move forward in that way for a sibling for your daughter. This next question comes from Livia in Florida. Livia says, can you please talk about the use of low-dose naltrexone in fertility treatments? Thank you. So Livia, absolutely. So low-dose naltrexone has been used for a really long time for lots of different reasons. And, and if you're a party animal and you like to drink alcohol, don't take it because it'll make you feel like kind of sick. Um, so what I use it for is patients who might have autoimmune premature or primary ovarian insufficiency, meaning they have really high FSH levels and they might have anti-adrenal, anti-ovarian or anti-thyroid antibodies. I have found anecdotally, and again, I should publish this one day, that people who take not just low dose naltrexone, but even higher dose naltrexone, um, they actually might start ovulating and it's a pretty fantastic thing to see happen and their FSH levels start to come down. So that's one. Number two, it's been shown in PCOS patients to make their ovaries more responsive. This all has to do with the opioid system in the brain. And I actually published a study on this. If you're bored one night, or I should say if you have insomnia one night and you can't sleep, just go to a website. It's PubMed and put in my last name, if you can spell it, Avazade, like have a nice day or Avaza flowers a day, but I don't think PubMed will accept that and put in the term opioid, O-P-I-O-I-D, I, I think I spelled it right, 
and you will read a study that um, a, a paper that I wrote about the opioid system and PCOS, and that's basically explaining how naltrexone will work in patients of PCOS. And there's another indication for naltrexone as well, and low dose naltrexone is patients who have antithyroid antibodies. And I'm not necessarily sure how it exactly works. I don't know that people actually know. They just know from anecdotal experience and the experience of lots of doctors who've done it. And they've, there's, I think it's basically a novel way to treat autoimmune issues. And, and what people have seen is antithyroid antibodies have come down in patients who take low dose naltrexone. So I learned this from a naturopath and I was like, no, this can't work. And then other docs have said they've had the same experiences. So I'm like, it's actually quite a benign drug and people actually, it's kind of like a happy pill. Some people actually feel, most of my patients who take it feel really, really good on it. And I just warn them if it's your birthday and you're gonna celebrate with some wine, please stop taking it for a day or two before because you're, you're not gonna enjoy that wine because of the other reasons why naltrexone is used. This next question is from Elle from California. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 35 years old. I have one daughter who's 16 from my first marriage and I have had one miscarriage at seven weeks and a chemical pregnancy last year via IUI. I only have one ovary. My AMH is 2.15, antral follicle count is 12. My cycles are 28 to 30 days and regular. My husband has mild male factor. Bad morphology was started on Clomid in November. His morphology is actually 1% normal. We recently had our first IVF cycle, nine days of stem, 150 menopure, 150 follicle, gamma relics, 80 unit Lupron trigger, six follicles, 18 millimeter plus on monitoring scans. Estrogen was coordinated as well. We retrieved nine eggs and only one was mature. Two matured slightly overnight. ICSI was done on all three and none made it to blast. Do you have any idea what happened and why we had nearly no mature eggs at all despite all good factors? I take supplements you recommend, but my doctor is baffled. I knew I needed to ask the expert for any insight and help. Please whisper to my eggs and ask them what's going on. That's really cute. Okay, I'm gonna try and whisper. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so what I'm thinking here is we have an, an issue and that is the issue of having very few and actually almost no mature eggs at the time of your egg retrieval. And I always tell people it's the most obvious things that are going to be the most obvious that are wrong, right? So let's just go to the most obvious. You told it to me. It's right there on that page. Blue prong trigger. It just wasn't enough. You need a little bit of HCG. So I use as much HCG as I possibly can for my triggers because we know, well, I'm not going to say we know. I'm just going to say in my experience, patients who get HCG have more mature eggs than patients who don't. So sometimes I actually like to combine them. So use a little bit of HCG and a little bit of Lupron together, or I'll use just a whole bunch of HCG and leave out the Lupron. So I don't think that what happened to you is something that is a big mystery. I call it a Lupron trigger failure. And your body just said, your eggs are not just having me whisper to them. They're screaming at us saying, just give me the darn HCG this time. So that's what I would do differently. So I'm not sure what happened with your blast. It says none made it to blast and I'm really sorry that that happened. But I would say next time consider HCG. I would also maybe add some HGH and I would look at your trigger shot timing and see if it was at 36 hours. If not, maybe consider doing your trigger shot at like 36 and a half hours. So there's maybe a little bit extra time for them to mature if they need a little extra time. So grow them a little juicier add a little HCG and maybe trigger it maybe 30 minutes um, earlier, earlier. So that's 36 and a half hours. Okay. This next question comes from Christian from South Carolina. What vitamins or supplements do you recommend for men to help with their sperm health and count? So this is a really good question. So for all the guys out there, I feel like every guy should be on a prenatal. I think every guy should be on CoQ10. I think every shit guy should be on a vitamin D. So one of the prenatals is um, there's a company called Natalis. So they have a prenatal. Theralogix through Conception XR, they have a type of prenatal that supports motility for guys. They also have a CoQ10. There's so many different companies out there that make this kind of stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, your diet is actually super important. So following uh, or eating anti-inflammatory foods, foods rich in antioxidants, following a Mediterranean type diet, all super helpful. Sleeping, reducing stress, exercising most days of the week, avoiding environmental toxins or toxicants as it, they should be officially uh, be called avoiding plastics, 
um, avoiding heating your food in plastic. So these are the things that I talk to my patients about and I'm glad you asked me, so now you guys know. This next question comes from Jen from Boston. Do you have a preferred IVF protocol for severe DOR, H35, undetectable AMH? I've tried a microdose flare protocol, mini stim, which developed one follicle each cycle. I had a natural successful pregnancy at age 30 with IVF with one follicle, and now I'm trying a third without success. So Jen, here's the thing. If your AMH is undetectable, the highest number of eggs that we can expect is one. So my thing is like, why are we blasting your ovaries with all this stuff? Let's go super low key, right? So let's go as many as we can to get as many eggs, but it seems like we should have the expectation that it should be one. So I like that analogy of just riding the waves and watching them come in from shore and then see which wave is a good one. So just keep showing up to your clinic, come in cycle day one, check your FSH estrogen dial, see where we're at two weeks later. If we don't like where we were at, look again, see how many follicles we have, and then see if it makes sense to start meds from there. Just continue to be open and flexible and creative and keep, like I said, keep showing up. And the fact that you got pregnant at 30 is really awesome. And so that was a natural pregnancy based on what you shared with us. No, no, no. You shared with us that a successful, oh, you had two pregnancies, a successful natural pregnancy and IVF with one follicle and now trying for a third without success. I see. So you see at 33, so you had a pregnancy at 30, an IVF pregnancy at 33, and now trying for a third baby. I get it. So you totally get it too, that it just takes one egg to have a healthy baby. And at this point, it seems like you'll only be able to get one and it just takes one. And so hopefully you'll get it with this, you know, next attempt. And so just keep, you know, watching those waves. Like I said, consider taking HGH, NAD, CoQ10, and ask your doctor about um, mid luteal phase stimulation or even duo stem, if that's something that they would consider for you to see when you might be able to get an egg. If you haven't done more genetic screening, do so. And what I mean by that, Fragile X chromosome analysis, it sounds like that probably won't be super high yield for you. And I bet you did it already. And then look at autoimmune stuff, anti-adrenal, anti-ovarian, anti-thyroid antibodies. See what's the why, like what the heck is happening and why is this happening to you at such a young age, Jen? That's something that would be really important for me. And earlier on Ask the Egg Whisperer today, I actually talked about using naltrexone in patients who have autoimmune primary ovarian insufficiency. And it might be something that your doctor considers for you as I've seen that it can help in cases just like yours. And it might be something that could help you as well. Okay, this next question comes from Shanna from Michigan. She's asking, is it safe to drink a smoothie during IVF treatment, especially after embryo transfer? So Shanna, that's actually a really good question and a question that I get a lot. And you guys are probably like, a smoothie? Why would anyone be asking about a smoothie? And you guys know why. It's because smoothies can have juices that are unpasteurized. So if you go to a juice bar, like at Whole Foods, for example, I haven't been to Whole Foods in God, no, God knows how long. But I imagine you go up and there's like a juice bar there and you'd be like, give me the smoothie. And what people don't realize is those juices are not pasteurized. So it's a really good question to ask before you're pregnant. Sure, you can have unpasteurized juices and a smoothie. After transfer, just be super picky about the juices that you're using, make sure you're making sure they're pasteurized so you're not putting yourself at risk for different infections that can come from unpasteurized juices. Okay, good question. This next question comes from Vivian in California. Hi, Dr. Amy, I turned 38 in February. I have a three-year-old son, conceived naturally only after two cycles of trying to conceive. I'm a fragile X carrier, been trying to conceive for two and a half years now. I've done one IUI, two rounds of IVF. My last round was in January, 2121. 12 eggs retrieved, six fertilized, two blasts, both were abnormal after PGT. I just can't afford IVF anymore, but IUIs are covered under insurance. Would it be wasting my time to consider doing IUIs at this point? I said I would be done after trying IU IVF, but now I also feel like I have another year till I turn 39. What is your advice? So here, Vivian, here's the deal. As a fragile X carrier, I'm curious to see how many repeats you have, right? I mean, I think that's really important because you want to see if it, number one, makes sense for you to do it without PGTM. And it sounds like it does. It sounds like your son doesn't have any issues. So I'm super excited about that and really happy to hear. So I'm sure you've already done all the genetic counseling needed to know everything you need to know about your fragile X carrier status. Let's just assume it's intermediate risk, gray zone, meaning no big deal. Then I would say anytime someone says, I want to get pregnant, right? You're accepting the risk of what? a negative pregnancy test, a miscarriage, and other things that can happen. It's important for us to all say that out loud because I know that at the beginning of our journeys, most people just think 
most people, not people watching Ask the Egg Whisperer, listening or tuning in, most people, the one thing that they're most surprised about when it comes time to trying to conceive and grow their family is how hard it is. Like most people thought it's one and done. A shot of tequila at the bar and you go home and you get pregnant or you get pregnant at the bar. <laughs> I'm cracking myself up tonight. Um, but getting pregnant is really hard for a lot of people. There are over 25 million people in this country right now who are struggling with trying to conceive. That's a whole lot of people. And so my message to you is this. There's nothing dangerous about trying at home. There's nothing dangerous about trying again after having IVF with two abnormal embryos. And I think what happens is people are given that piece of paper that says your embryos are abnormal, then all of a sudden you think that you could never make a normal embryo again, and then you all of a sudden internalize that you might be, especially if you are already a mom to another baby, that you're somehow being selfish, that you could bring a baby that might have problems that be a burden on your first baby. Like these are all the things that my patients do is they have all these negative thoughts and that's normal. But my message to you is everything that you're thinking about trying again is exactly what I would have you consider as well. I would have you consider being as aggressive as possible with your stimulation to help as many eggs grow so you can have a, a, as many opportunities to grow the egg that's going to be that winner or what I call the golden sparkling egg that will turn into the sparkling embryo that will help you be a mom again to another baby. And, and I don't know that you have to feel like you have to do IVF or that doing IVF um, is needed for you to have another baby. The positives in your case are you make mature eggs, they fertilize, they grow to blastocysts, and the fact that they're not normal is perfectly normal for someone who is 38 years old. And ask your doctor, did you guys report mosaicism to me? Is there any chance that these two abnormal embryos are actually mosaic and you're calling them abnormal? So that's something that I'm pretty passionate about teaching people about, and that's why it's the M in embryodiamonds.com for those of you guys who want to read more about that there. So I agree with you. I feel like if you still want to try IUI, I would totally support that, and I've done that with my patients, and I've done that successfully with them as well. This next question comes from Lois from Uganda. You, Lois is asking, thank you, doctor, for all you do. Love you much. I'm struggling with mild insomnia in my first trimester. Any advice on what I could take that is safe in early pregnancy to help me sleep? I'm already cranky from the hormones and I really would like to sleep. Also, what's the ideal thickness of the endometrium to support implantation? Thank you for all you do for us and keep rocking the blue dresses. Lois, I'm sorry I'm not wearing blue. Next time, I'll wear it for you. Okay, so my suggestion for helping with sleep in pregnancy would be Unisom. So Unisom is something that actually is FDA approved with another name to help with nausea and vomiting. So it's like a twofer, right? You get the help maybe with nausea, the symptoms that you're having in pregnancy, and you're getting help with the sleep issue. So maybe consider taking Unisom to help with sleep. Other things that I've suggested my patients, and just because I'm suggesting doesn't mean that your doctor recommends it for you. There are other sleep aids out there like Tylenol PM, Benadryl, um, even melatonin is something that I sometimes tell my pregnant patients that it's okay to take. Again, talk to your physician first because this show is just for education and information and to raise awareness and help you know what questions to ask your physician and see what they say too. Okay, this next question comes from Magda from Poland. She says, hi, I'm 40 and I had one super easy and healthy pregnancy seven years ago. I started trying for baby number two in November of 2019. Due to my age, started with a fertility check with the IVF clinic and my AMH is 0.6. Having no success for four months, um, I did IUI in May. I got pregnant. However, I had a miscarriage in July. The heartbeat was faint from the start. Then did IVF in September and December. Total eggs retrieved 12, 11 mature, 10 fertilized, four made it to day three, and then stopped growing. My husband's semen analysis showed, uh, let's see here, low morphology and 20% DNA fragmentation. But after the lab prep, 10% was a very good quality. So labs that they have enough to pick the best ones in MC. We decide to start now with egg donor. My doctor says to choose from any donor below the age of 32. Shouldn't it be better though to go for a donor below the age of 30? Which egg donor age would you recommend? In my frozen egg program, I get the batch of 12 mature eggs. So Magda, you're right. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, the truth is that the younger the egg donor, the higher the viability of the eggs. However, there are some egg donors who are 32 years old whose eggs behave like 22-year-old eggs. So I think before you pick an egg donor, you have to ask the following questions. 
fertilization rate, blast formation rate, pregnancy rate, and then if they're doing genetic testing, ask the euploidy rate beforehand as well. So basically you can ask, typically from this set of eggs, how many blastuses have you gotten in the end? What's their pregnancy rate? How many miscarriages have happened? So these are the questions that I ask of the egg bank. And they might say, no, we don't have this information because no one has used these eggs. And that's okay too. But number one is to find an egg donor that you're super excited about. Number two, I agree. I think that if you don't have all the technical information that I shared with you, picking a donor that's 25 or younger would be better. But I still don't discriminate against fabulous donors that are 30 or 32. This next question comes from Alexis from California. Hi, Dr. Amy. I'm 39. I've been trying to conceive baby number two for nine months. I've done my labs, had an HSG, and my husband had completed his semen analysis, and here are my numbers. Estrogen less than 50, FSH 11.6, AMH 4.76, LH 6.9, prolactin 4, TSH 1.3, hemoglobin A1C 5.1, HSG normal, sperm morphology 4%, motility 74. My healthcare provider is so backed up. I don't have an appointment. Are you guys ready for this? To talk to someone until May. Given these numbers, anything that stands out to you? Anything we can be doing now to better our, our odds? Where do we go from here? Thank you. Okay, Alexis, diagnosis before treatment. Let's break it down. Number one, we have your age at 39. It's harder to find a good egg as a woman gets older. It's awesome that you already have a baby and now we're trying for baby number two, but it might be a little bit harder to get pregnant with baby number two just because of your age. Number two, we have an FSH of 11.6, which says, holy smokes, thank goodness you asked these questions now because guess what? Your fertile women your fertile women, it's like little women, um, your fertile window is open. It's open to me and it should stay open and you should think of it as open to you. Sometimes when you go to a fertility clinic, and I'm so glad you asked me these questions right now before May, because sometimes you go in and they actually give you bad news. They say things like, well, since your FSH is over 10, your chances of having a healthy pregnancy are really, really low. And what I would say is, your FSH of 11.6 is pretty darn normal for most women who are 39, and the fact that their AMH is so high, for me, is a really, really good sign. You are someone at 39 who has a really good chance of still having a good egg left, but you have to be open to the possibility that it might take several tries, and it sounds like you are. It might take more than one cycle of IVF to get one healthy embryo, but it sounds like you're in good position because guess what? You got a great sperm count, and the only thing is the sperm morphology is a little bit low. So let's get you guys on and all the egg quality and sperm quality supplements that I always talk to you guys about. Make sure you've checked your fallopian tubes and it looks like you have. And then the only other thing that I would say is start talking to your husband about different treatments that you guys will feel comfortable doing. So the different treatments would be IUI, where you take fertility pills to increase the number of eggs you ovulate, or IVF. And then remember to consider doing a sperm DNA fragmentation test, maybe repeat a sperm test to look at his morphology before you decide on IUI versus IVF. Because if his sperm DNA fragmentation isn't good, you might be wasting your time on IUIs that won't work. However, if his sperm DNA fragmentation is, uh, you know what I'm saying, if his sperm DNA fragmentation is bad, I don't want you to be wasting your time on IUIs that don't work. But if his sperm DNA fragmentation is good and his sperm is sparkling everywhere, like everywhere, like they're shouting, like, look at this guy's sperm. I know it's embarrassing when we do that in, in the clinic, but sometimes it happens because sometimes sperm is very impressive and we just have to talk about it because it's so exciting. Those are the kinds of things that excite us here. Um, then I would say that doing IUI or IVF would be a good option for you. It sounds like you have lots of options, but see what you can do to get the morphology up and live your healthiest, healthy lives eating healthy, sleeping well, decreasing stress, doing micro meditations, doing deep breathing, and then remember you can fly. I should sing a Bette Midler song right now. I can fly. And you guys are wondering, what the hell is she talking about? I can fly. Has she lost her mind? What is she drinking in her glass? And right now I'm drinking water. And when I say fly, I mean first love yourself. Okay? Hope you guys don't forget that. Fly. Okay, let's go to the next question from Lynn. Lynn is in Oregon, and Lynn says, do you have any information on natural cycle IVF? As far as I know, my eggs are okay, but I have a heart arrhythmia, and I'd like to avoid hormones that could cause symptoms. I want to freeze my eggs for a baby girl. Okay, Lynn, so here's the deal. Let's start with a little bit of something, something. What I mean by a little bit of something, something, let's just start with fertility pills. And then with fertility pills, you can see how you feel. For the most part, fertility pills don't make people have heart issues. And then you can add a fertility shot and then for the most part, people don't have heart issues with any of these medications, but sometimes you can get a little bit of anxious, you can get insomnia, you can get some headaches, you can get nausea, 
And those side effects can cause your heart to race a little bit if you're feeling super stressed out. So you want to see how you feel and maybe treat whatever symptoms you're having. So if you're feeling stressed out about the process, maybe try a low-dose anti-anxiety medication. But before you even do that, consider acupuncture, um, all the mindfulness stuff that I'm always talking about. Go to fertilityteam.com to learn more about all my suggestions that I give to all you guys out there. But I would say as far as a heart arrhythmia, get clearance from a cardiologist. The anesthesiologist will want that before your cycle. And you can try a mini IVF cycle with the stuff that I just talked about. And I bet you're going to have a really good experience with a doctor that will totally make sure that your priorities are theirs. And if your priority is have a baby girl and to be on less stimulation to prevent a heart arrhythmia, that is doable. No one can promise, just like no one can promise Paris Hilton, a boy and a girl, the way she's talking about it, no one can promise anybody a girl embryo. In order to do that, your sperm, if you have a partner and or you're, you know, has to wear pink every single day for three months. That's a joke. Okay, this next question comes from Christine in California. Christine says, I'm 44 years old. All my tests have been pretty good for my age. I just received IVF clearance. I'm starting with mini IVF. What are your thoughts on this? Is it worth it? Thank you. So Christine, it is worth it. So you got to give yourself the pep talk. The pep talk is this, have no expectations and find joy throughout this process and realize that the likelihood of finding a good egg at 44 is pretty darn low. But if you find it, it's going to be amazing and awesome. And if you don't, you're going to be a mother one way or another. It might not be with your own DNA and that's okay. So those are the things that I share with my patients, but I am obviously very, very biased. I think it's worth it. But as long as you understand what your chances are, you don't want to go in feeling misled. For example, if you went in thinking that four eggs would be turned into eight, and eight eggs means eight embryos, we have a problem. If you realize that four eggs might be zero to one blastocyst, and there's a very high chance that that blastocyst might be abnormal, then you're in a good situation of being honest and having a doctor that's being very transparent with you about your chances. So print out the IVF pyramid. You can find it on my website. Just put an IVF pyramid on the search engine there and print that out, show it to your doc and say, can you fill in these numbers for me and tell me what my IVF pyramid will look like? Super important for everybody, but especially if you're 44 going through this process, but I think mini IVF is a great idea for someone who wants a chance at pregnancy and it's a great way of getting eggs to grow if your ovaries will agree with me. Okay. This next question comes from Sarah in New York. Sarah says, I'm 32 years old, my husband's 34. We've been trying for one and a half years. We sought help back in November. My labs were run. A semen analysis was done on my husband. Everything came out normal. I did Clomid in December. Went for a follicle check. The follicle size was good, but the lining was only five millimeters. During the ultrasound, the nurse said, this is really funny, <laughs> that my ultrasound results looked PCOS-y. Okay, guys, that's not a thing, but I get it. But the doctor said that my PCOS panel was normal. Long story short, the doctor advised us that five millimeters is not thick enough, but we could still do the trigger shot and take our chances. So we did, and we didn't get pregnant. In January of this year, we tried Femera. Same thing again, went for an ultrasound. Follicles looked great, and lining was 9.5 millimeters. Did the trigger shot, and still nothing. We did get pregnant once last May, but miscarried at seven weeks. Advice, IUI, or keep trying. Okay, so here's the deal. You're 32 years old. Okay, that nurse said something, and that should be something really important to grab onto. Why did she call your ovaries pcos -y? And I really like that she actually used words and described what she's saying, because now you're gonna go back and you're gonna ask the doctor, what did she mean by that? What's my follicle count? What's my diagnosis? What have you ruled out for me? Because as a 32 year old who's been trying for one and a half years, my concern is that egg quality might be an issue. And that's something that I would wanna know sooner or later. It sounds like you looked at all the PCOS labs and there is no evidence that you need to be on any specific treatment for PCOS. It sounds like you're responding really, really well to the Femera, and that's awesome. But what is truly our diagnosis? Why are we here? Have you had a tube check done? Has your husband had a formal semen analysis done recently? If his sperm is not sparkling, um, have you done a sperm DNA fragmentation test? And the definition of sparkle, <laughs> I should have like spermsparkle.com and you can go see what my definition of sperm sparkling is but I do not have that. Um, my concern is at 32 years old with one and a half years of trying it might make sense to bank embryos. I don't think people know or maybe they know or maybe they don't how you can use technology to preserve your fertility because 
Sarah, if you were a 32-year-old woman that came to me and you said, you know, Dr. Amy, I'm considering having two kids. I would say, well, let's freeze eggs. But people are going to their fertility doctors and saying, I'm married. I've been trying for one and a half years. Why aren't we saying, please freeze embryos? You don't need IVF, right? Like, I bet your tubes are open. His sperm probably is fine. Your hormone levels are good. You have lots of eggs on your ovaries because she called them pcos -y. So why would you still do IVF? Well, we would do it to preserve your fertility for your future. You're only 32 years old. I want you to harness that 32-year-old energy in those eggs now, not when you're 35. I don't want you to have a baby and then three years later, you're like, why didn't someone have this conversation with me? Like, why? So that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to teach you guys about embryo banking and how it can help you in a situation like this. And at the end of the day, do all the stuff that I talk about, the tushy method, the angel method, the balls method, go through all my methods and then sign up for my IVF class. If you're considering IVF, you can go to eggwhisperschool.com or just go to my website, dreamy.org. It's not really dreamy. I, I, I should create a wrap that includes all these mnemonics in there, but um, I'm sorry for everything that you've gone through, but I still feel like there's a really good chance for you to get pregnant, even without IVF, especially because you had that miscarriage in May but let that pregnancy teach us something and make sure you've done all the necessary tests beforehand. And like I said, literally go to every little method that I just talked about and figure out the why. Ask your doctor, what have you ruled out? Have you ruled out a uterine septum? Have you ruled out a genetic abnormality in me and my husband? See what I mean? There's still tests that can guide you so you know which way to go moving forward, but I feel like there's lots of hope here, Sarah. Okay, this next question comes from Shadi. Shadi from California says, hi, Dr. Amy. I feel smarter by watching your shows. Thank you. I'm 41 years old with a history of decreased ovarian reserve. My AMH is 0 0.05, history of a laparoscopic myomectomy at age 37, three unsuccessful IUIs at age 38, and one IVF cycle at age 39. I have to do IVF abroad because the embryos will be there. Would you please let me know what I need to do to maximize the outcomes of my FET and minimize the absence of days from work? Due to my premenopausal state, I'm experiencing regular cycles. Do I need to be on birth control? If so, for how long in advance? If the first vet didn't work, how long later can I try the second? I'm on vitamin D, folic acid, CoQ10. What other supplements should I take? What's my chance to have a successful vet? Thanks for making your follows a smarter patient. Shadi, thank you for, for all that positive feedback and for helping me want to carpe the heck out of my DM and to make you guys as smart as possible about your fertility health. Literally, that's what I'm here for. So my advice to you is this. Um, make sure that you're living your healthiest, healthy life through diet, exercise, sleep, breathing, environmental toxins, all that kind of stuff. Look at everything. Number two, because your cycles are irregular, yes, I would use birth control pills, especially if you're traveling abroad, as frozen embryo transfer preparedness pills. I have patients that come to me and they also see doctors abroad and I actually coordinate care with them. I even coordinate things for those doctors like the ERA tests and other implantation tests, sailing sonograms. So make sure you've done all of those things. And if your first embryo transfer doesn't work because of COVID, I'm not sure exactly where you're going abroad. You might actually want to stay there. Don't come back, stay there and wait for your period to start. And then you can transfer three weeks later. So that's one thing that I would suggest for you. As far as supplements, the other thing I would add is fish oil if you're not on it already. Make sure you're prenatal, you're on a prenatal and it already sounds like you're doing vitamin D, folic acid and CoQ10. The CoQ10 can't hurt at all, but at the end of the day, it's a diet rich in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory foods that will be the most helpful. This next question comes from Sabrina in Dallas. Sabrina says, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and being so entertaining to watch. You're welcome. I'm 36 and went through my first egg retrieval in October of 2020 at age 35. My AMH was 0.94, FSH was 7.6. My follicle count during the retrieval was low, four on the right ovary and one on the left. I was shocked to have such a low follicle count and a sleepy ovary, but even more shocked when my doctor retrieved only two eggs. She said the other follicles were empty. Both eggs were mature, thankfully. My clinic gave me no answers as to what happened with this cycle, just said we can do better. However, I have a theory. After researching myself, I read that spironolactone is an androgen blocker. I was on 50 milligrams for acne up until I started stimulation. Do you think the spironolactone caused my poor response and affected my AMH? I read androgens are crucial in folliculogenesis and ovarian function. I'm off sprono now, but scared to do another retrieval. Help. So this is the thing. You got two eggs out of 
five follicles. So the question is, did you get two eggs out of five follicles or did you get two eggs out of two follicles because maybe you ovulated? I believe in honesty and transparency. The other day I had a patient, she had four follicles and one ovulated. And I told her at the time of the retrieval, look, I drained eggs out of three follicles and I ended up getting two eggs. That way you're not feeling like I have to do my own research. I have to figure out what happened and what went wrong. And do you know what I do for my patients? I take pictures. As I'm doing the egg retrieval, I'm taking a picture of each egg. Guess what? That's so that patients can see what happened. Most of my patients actually have five or less eggs because most of my patients are over the age of 37. And so every single follicle that has any egg inside is going to be so important to us. And I want to show my patients that I'm doing a really good job for them. So that if, let's say, they have five follicles and I get two eggs, they know the reason why it isn't because they ovulated. But in a case like yours, it could be that. It could be the trigger shot. It could be the size of the follicles at the time of the trigger. I'm not sure it's due to this frontolactone. It probably isn't, but that's a really easy thing to check. Check your testosterone level and see where you're at and see, depending on the level, whether you know your doctor thinks you benefit from testosterone priming or DHEA. I'm not a big fan of those things, but I would say if your doctor you know, has a lot of experience with them and thinks that they would play a good role in your situation, then I would say perhaps consider adding that. But Sabrina, I still think that there's a good chance with your, um, with your age being 36, your AMH being 0.94, you have a really good chance of getting more eggs. And maybe you were over suppressed with birth control pills before your cycle. So consider a natural cycle start. Ask your doctor to repeat your AMH because your AMH level suggests that you should have closer to 10 eggs, not five. So see whether you were over suppressed going into the cycle from some sort of prep that you did before you started stimulation. Okay, this next question is from Ariel in Texas. Ariel is saying, is Pixie better than ICSI for embryo quality? Can a man's thyroid levels affect the quality of his sperm? So for those of you guys who are like, what's Pixie? I just thought of ICSI, what's Pixie? So Pixie is a way of picking the sperm cell before you inject it, which is ICSI. Normally when you do ICSI, you look under a microscope and you pick the most beautiful sparkling sperm, and then you pick it up and you put it into an egg, and that's the ICSI part. The Pixie, you still do the ICSI part, but before you do the ICSI part, you actually pick the sperm out from the dish, and then you pick the beautiful sparklers from there and put them in the egg. Is Pixie for everyone? No. Can it reduce sperm DNA fragmentation? Yes. How do you know if you need it? You can do a sperm DNA fragmentation test ahead of time, or you can just ask your doctor to add Pixie to your case if, let's say, you already know the morphology is low. So my strategy is to kind of just do Pixie on everybody. So if you're like, I don't want to do Pixie, I'm like, we're still going to do it just because I want your embryos to make me look good. I'm just kidding, I don't force people to do anything that they don't want to do. As far as a man's thyroid levels, yes, there is evidence that abnormal thyroid function in a man can cause low sperm quality. So sometimes I actually do check thyroid levels in the man, and especially if he has like a really strong family history of thyroid problems, then it's definitely something we check. That's part of the balls, the L, for labs that we do on guys who have low sperm quality. Looking at thyroid is sometimes one of the tests that we do. This next question comes from Diana in Pennsylvania. I am 27 years old. I've had three failed rounds of IVF. My first cycle, I did one fresh transfer and one frozen and both failed. My second and third round of IVF resulted in zero embryos. My doctor told me I have poor egg quality due to my PCOS and she said there's no fix so I have to move on to donor eggs. Oh, do you think there's hope with my own eggs? Okay. Wow, that's pretty heavy stuff, Diana. To hear at 27 years old that you need an egg donor, it's also pretty admirable that you have fought so hard that you've gone through through three, I can say the word three, I promise, three IVF cycles. Wow. So there's obviously something that we're missing here. Why? Why is this happening to you? If you have PCOS, that means you have lots of eggs. But lots of eggs doesn't necessarily mean lots of bad eggs. Lots of eggs just means we got to figure out what's going on with those eggs. Have you done genetic testing? Have you looked at fragile X screen? Have you done a chromosome analysis for both you and your husband? I would definitely look at that. And then consider my egg quality supplement blend. Okay, so I talk about it all the time. And in a case like yours, make sure you've healed your PCOS. The PCOS supplements that sometimes I have my patients take are ovocetol and acetylcysteine, lipoic acid. Ask your doctor if you should take potentially metformin. Make sure your testosterone level is low. If it isn't, high testosterone could be affecting things. Ask your doctor if there's a chance you have endometriosis because that can also affect egg quality. It can make the eggs of a woman behave older than her chronological age, so it can increase your egg age versus your chronological age. And then last but not least, consider HGH. And I think it's so hard to think about using an egg donor at 27 when you have eggs, 
but sometimes it comes to that. And so I think having an answer, having a piece of paper that gives you an answer as to why you need a donor egg might be hard to find and the real life experience gets you there. But at the same time, there's so many different ways, you guys, of making a momlet. I wouldn't give up quite yet, unless you feel like you're just done and you wanna move on and you wanna move on with something that's gonna work 85% of the time, then I would say choosing an egg donor is just fine. Move on, don't look back without any regret, but I don't want you to regret learning that there could have been other options for you as well. So this next question comes from Karen in New York and Karen says, hi, Dr. Amy, my questions are this, what supplements do you recommend during the time leading up to the embryo transfer and after retrieval? I'm gonna answer this question first. So supplements during uh, leading up to the egg retrieval, I tell people to take CoQ10, prenatal vitamin, vitamin D, fish oil, and then if they have a low egg quality, NAD, terostildine, if they have PCOS, also add ovacetol. And sometimes there are other things that patients take too. Um, as far as leading up to the embryo transfer, vitamin D, prenatal vitamin, and fish oil. And in some patients, I also have them continue CoQ10. What supplements do you recommend not be taken during the entirety of the IVF process? Um, CBD? I don't know if that's a supplement. THC? Probably not a supplement. Anything that comes in unmarked, unmarked bottles that you can't read and, or know what's in it yourself. Anything that comes outside the U.S. you have to be really careful about because of the fact that it could be contaminated due to you know heavy metals in the soil. I've actually had a patient get lead poisoning from something that she got from an herbalist. She thought it was good and then she showed it to me. I'm like, what is this? It had no writing on the bottle. I was like, you need to have heavy metal toxin testing. She did and sure enough, she was positive. So don't trust everything that you're handed. Always ask, what is this? Where did it come from? And why am I taking it? And why are you giving it to me? Um, also, you mentioned tarot still being quite frequently. Can you speak a little bit more about the benefits? Yes, it's been shown with NAD to potentially help with egg quality. You can also take it alone. It's all part of that thought process of antioxidants can help with egg quality, and certainly it's a very potent antioxidant. Finally, I've been diagnosed with endometriosis by several doctors, and my HSG showed that my left tube was blocked, occluded, occluded, occluded people at the cornua. My doctor said that it could have just been the fluid from the right that blocked the left. However, I've had these dull pains on the left side of my pelvic area since before the test was done. Do you think this is, could be caused by endometriosis? This is a lot of questions, but I appreciate your feedback. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are so loved. <sighs> Karen, yes, I think your pain could definitely be from endometriosis. Your left tube was blocked on HSG, so we have to believe that test to be true. And, you know, this is the thing. I think you're just letting me say to people what I'm constantly saying here is that so much of tubal factor infertility, women are told, oh, it's a chlamydia, or it's a gonorrhea, or it's an STD, because obviously when you Google it, that's what you see. But I think the reality is a lot of times it's endometriosis that's gone, on, gone undiagnosed. So consider doing embryo creation, followed by embryo transfer preparation would be a laparoscopy to clean up the endometriosis and potentially remove the fallopian tube especially if you have pain there, and that could increase your chance of implantation and decrease your risk of ectopic. Not everybody needs surgery like this before a transfer, but some people might benefit more than others, and you, Karen, could be one of those people. Next question comes from Jennifer. Jennifer says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 34 years old, G0P0, predictable 28-day cycles, AMH 2.73, normal HSG, tried for two years, four IUIs with three follicles each time, great sperm counts, all failed, motility 2% normal. I did one cycle of IVF, 22 antrals, 10 mature eggs, eight fertilized, five day six blast, all PGS abnormal or mosaic. The clinic will transfer none. Any suggestions on protocol changes, supplements, lifestyle changes, tests, or anything that can improve another cycle? Everyone keeps telling me I should be an easy case, but I keep failing. I'm so discouraged. Okay, here's the deal, Jennifer. Your low mosaic embryos can be perfectly normal and turn into healthy pregnancies. So have hope. Talk to a genetic counselor that's affiliated with a genetic testing company that you're working with. Talk to an outside genetic counselor that's not part of the lab that you've used to test. Get an unbiased opinion and get a second opinion from another fertility doctor that accepts mosaic embryos in their practice and transfers them so that you can get their opinion about what you should do next. It feels much better, obviously, to transfer an embryo that says normal on it, but a mosaic embryo can be a perfectly normal baby. So the way you would know is you would transfer it and then you can test in pregnancy and then find out if it is normal or not. 
So my suggestion is to still be open-minded about using your low mosaic embryos. I have not had an experience of transferring a high mosaic that has turned into anything but a negative pregnancy test or a miscarriage yet. I'm not sure I'll ever have a high mosaic turn into a healthy embryo, but I've certainly had the experience of having low mosaics turn into healthy babies for years now. So my recommendation is to consider all the egg quality supplements I talk about for you and your husband. Your diagnosis could be a fertilization issue due to sperm. So what does that mean? We want to do a sperm fragmentation test. Men who have elevated DNA fragmentation will have embryos with more chromosomal abnormalities. So while you are probably saying, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I'm saying, have we ruled out enough stuff in the sperm? Have we done the things that we need to do to make the sperm sparkle? Have we ruled out an abnormal DNA fragmentation? Are we talking about adding extra tools in the lab to improve the chances of having healthy embryos? So the supplements, you guys all know about them. The HGH, I talk about all the time if your doctor agrees. Lifestyle stuff, you got this. But I would say at the end of the day, the sperm probably has a, might have, might have a story to tell us. And if not, sometimes you just have a cycle that doesn't give you a healthy embryo. And that happens and it's super annoying and that's okay. But the fact that you have the number of blastocysts that you have means you should not lose hope and keep trying. And um, I hope all the information you guys heard today has helped you. So that's it for Ask the Egg Whisperer today. I'm gonna go through your, your questions right now that you guys have live, live chatted just for a little while because I gotta review instructions with people who need my help. I've already sent them all out, but I like to make sure people um, hear my voice and have me review their instructions over the phone as well. Next question, what happens if I take letrozole later in my cycle when my body is already gearing up to ovulate? Will it mess things up? So if your body has already picked an egg to ovulate, it doesn't make sense to talk to your ovaries to ovulate if you're already doing it already. So you'd have to ask your doctor, why are you giving me letrozole when I'm already ovulating? I don't know, either. Next question is, my period never returned after my 22 week loss in June of 2020 until I did Leprosol. I had an 11 week miscarriage two weeks ago and I can't wait four months again because I'm 40 so I wanna take it now. Okay, so here's the deal. In a case like yours, I would follow your HCG levels and as soon as negative, I would induce a period, okay? Like induce it right away so that we can start trying again. I totally get it. Time is of the essence. And if you're open to IVF, consider doing IVF as soon as possible so you can bank embryos and test them. I'm not sure if genetic abnormalities had anything to do with your losses, but if they did, this could rule that out. Next question from Marianne. Husband has unexplained low sperm motility and count, recently diagnosed and treated with a parasite blastocytis hominis, had severe IVF, IBS when had this. Could this be the cause of poor sperm health? And the answer is yes. Any type of infection or inflammation for a guy can affect his sperm. The answer is yes. Um, if you use donor eggs, do you recommend PGS testing still? So it just depends on your goals. You know, how many kids you want, does gender matter? When you're using someone else's DNA, for a lot of people, they really want to make sure that the chromosomes are normal of the embryo. Do you need to do genetic testing of the embryos? No, because obviously we know that embryo health has a lot to do with the age of the egg, certainly the age of the sperm too. But I certainly recommend it for sure if the sperm age is 50 or above. I recommend it if you want several kids and you want to make sure you have enough embryos with this egg donor that you've used. And then if gender is something that you're interested in knowing, obviously you have to do chromosome testing first. Next question, if somebody may have to do IVF in the future, what, what teaching would you do considering they know the process for IUI but not IVF? So go to my IVF class, eggwhisperschool.com, of course, and sign up. It's a one hour class. I really just pack a punch in that one hour and talk to you guys about everything you need to know, how to get your eggs and sperm to sparkle, how to get to a diagnosis, how to choose the right IVF protocol for you. And I know a lot of it is not about choice. It's about being told what to do, but then you have to know if that's the right option for you and then know what questions to ask. And I go through all the mnemonics that I just rattle off here. But basically, IUI and IVF is the same deal, right? Taking medications to stimulate your ovaries and then you you basically either do IUI on the day that you're the most fertile or you actually pluck the eggs. Not necessarily plucking, but do an egg retrieval around the same time. 
Next question is, what is the HC or HSG wash? Also, can you recommend a fertility doctor and or clinic in New York? So I think you mean HCG wash. So that's where you take a tiny little bit of HCG, load it up in the catheter, push it at the top of the uterus right before the embryo. That's called the HCG wash. There's so many awesome doctors in New York. We got Dr. Murphy. We got Dr. Jeffrey Wong. We got Dr. Talabian. We got Dr. Levine. We got RMA New York. I mean, you really can't go wrong in New York. There's so many fabulous. Oh, we got Shady Grove. I mean, you can't go wrong. So I think it's just a matter of what's your diagnosis and then making sure that that clinic has a really good plan for you, that they've talked to you about your IVF pyramid and you really feel like you have a good, communica or good communication with that doctor and then go for it. Next question is, where can I submit my question? Asiagwhisper.com. And then some creepy guy out there is saying, nice dress, hubba hubba. <laughs> That's my husband, <laughs> you're being cute. Okay, next question is, if money was not an issue, would you recommend embryo banking or a second retrieval cycle to a patient with stage four endometriosis who has five or less normal embryos available for an FET and wants normal children? Yes, so it just depends on what your embryo quality is, what's the implantation rate per embryo, so ask your doctor. I'd especially want you to do more IVF if your doctor says that you have adenomyosis. So rank the embryos, give them, have them give you percentages, and then just sit down and kind of go through those percentages and see what makes sense for you. Next question is, my progesterone is 0 0.8, LH is 15.8. Does this mean I ovulate? The answer is no. Do you always recommend HGH for, to your patients? If no, in what cases do you recommend it? And the answer is I don't recommend it for someone who's, let's say, less than 35 with tubal factor infertility. I don't recommend it in someone who has a perfectly normal and, uh, AMH, FSH, who's doing it for male factor infertility, you don't need HGH. But I do it for my egg freezing patients, for example, who are over the age of 35, anyone who has an elevated FSH, no matter their age, anyone, even if their levels are good, who's done IVF before, who had low quality embryos, and everyone over the age of 40, no matter their history or their hormone levels. Next question, what are your thoughts of using an embroscope? It's 2000 extra, my clinic says it's great, but everything I read says the data doesn't show any benefit yet. I'm telling you, it's really cool to be able to log into your app for the embryo scope and take a look at your embryos and watch them grow. I mean, that's pretty incredible and pretty special. Is it worth 2000 bucks to you? If the answer is yes, do it. If the answer is no, then don't worry about it. Next question is, that is such a good question. My transfer was two weeks ago. I've been juicing like a mad woman. See what I mean? She's referring to my smoothie question. Dr. Amy, I'm five days post-transfer. When do you think it's a good time to test? I'm telling you, once you start testing, it is so hard to stop. So I'm gonna tell you, resist the urge. But if you really need to test, maybe day seven. I test all my patients eight days post five day transfer. You come in for a blood draw. That's how it works here. Next question. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm a Hodgkin lymphoma survivor. Remission for 12 years. Would you, would you suggest to stay away from HGH with my history? So the reason why you're asking is HGH um, for long-term use, especially in older people who are at higher risk of cancer are at increased risk potentially, according to studies of getting cancer. Does HGH cause cancer? I don't think so. And someone who's worried about cancer, I wouldn't take it. It's as simple as that. Next question, I'm an identical twin. I think that means the same DNA. If my sister donated her eggs to me, would that be considered donor egg still or would that be basic, baby be basically mine? So that's a really good question. And I've actually had identical twins and one actually had early menopause and one didn't they were literally identical, like they'd been studied before. And it was like wild stuff, right? And it just shows that sometimes there can be something in an environment that can turn something on in one twin that didn't turn it on in the other. So to answer your question, it probably is still considered donor eggs because she's donating an egg to you. But if the genes are identical, then it's just like using your genes. Next question. Hi, Dr. Amy. Is it normal to only see three antral follicles on day three of luteal phase stem? During the follicular phase, I only stem for nine days before egg retrieval, retrieved four eggs only. And the answer is if you got four eggs on the first end and then three eggs on the second end, and what I mean by that first half, second half is really what I mean to say, three is not that different than four, so that's pretty normal. But when you're looking at these waves of eggs coming in, you want to be sure that you're riding a good wave and a wave that you think it's worth riding. So if you feel like three eggs isn't worth it for you, then don't ride that wave. Just wait until maybe you have a better wave. What's considered below average follicle count on day two ultrasound for someone who's 30 to 35? So, I mean, below average, I mean, the average egg count for someone who's 30 to 35 is around 10. So below average would probably be less than 10 is what I would say. 
Next question, what do you think about using Zymot and Pixie together? DNA fragmentation is 14%, sperm count is 5 million, I'm 39, my husband's 42. So in a case like that, I would use one or the other. I don't think you need both. Can we find the success rate of your clinic on the CDC website? So I don't report to SART or the CDC. I'm considered a non-reporting doctor. And that's because I don't want people to use my success rates to, to think that somehow, let me just say it like this. I take everyone who has an egg and who wants a chance at pregnancy. Whether you're a 39-year-old with an FSH of 6 or a 29-year-old with an FSH of 39, I'm going to give you a chance. And I think the problem with some of these reporting websites is people use them to then compare doctors and then doctors use them not, I mean, of course they deserve it, to use it as a marketing tool, but there are doctors who cherry pick patients. They only take patients who have six or more follicles. They only take patients who have an FSH level of, let's say, um, 12 or less. And I've literally seen letters that doctors have sent patients that say, you don't qualify for our IVF program. And they do that because they want really high rates. They want rates to be shining on that website. And I'm not going to do that. So next question is, I've heard you mention a specific time to trigger at 36 hours versus 36 and a half. How important is that time window? I'm on the second month of letrozole. I've been told to trigger at any time, not 36 hours. So what I would say to that is it's very specific and that's only with IVF. So if someone is telling you it doesn't matter when you trigger, I have a feeling what you're talking about is doing IUIs. I'm 40 years old. I have a super regular period. Let's see here. I have a super regular period, 26 days, and this month I'm late, 12 days, and not pregnant. Is Provera the only suggestion until, will Provera, Provera interfere with my cycle next month? I personally do not use Provera. I use Prometrium instead. It's bioidentical, and I think it is better. I just have my, my reasons for that. Um, Dr. Amy, what's a good antral follicle count for a 31-year-old? And I would say a good antral follicle count for a 31-year-old, you know, the thing is when you're young, even if you have a follicle count of five, it's still pretty darn good. And at 31, you should still have really gorgeous eggs, even if you have five of them. So that's the benefit of being 31. And there's no such thing as, as being 31 and having the eggs of a 41 year old. And I think it's really mean to tell a 31 year old that, not that I'm saying that there's anything wrong with being 41, because obviously I'm not but I find that sometimes this messaging that we give young people about their levels makes them feel bad and that's not good. So I'd like to think that happy patient, happy eggs, happy embryos, I don't know, maybe there's something to that. But I would say I wouldn't be too upset if your follicle count was even five or less at 31. I think just being young and having less young eggs is still a really good thing. Um, next question, does surgery help with varicocele or is it better to do IVF? So as far as varicocele surgery, Yes or no, I actually let the quality and the DNA fragmentation guide me. If the DNA fragmentation is good and my patient wants to do IVF and she doesn't want to wait for a varicocelectomy to work for her to get pregnant naturally, if it can somehow improve sperm quality, then I would say let's do IVF. If the sperm DNA fragmentation is really terrible and the sperm count is really terrible, then I would say let's consider fixing that varicocele first. However, if your age is let's say 42 or 43 and we don't have time to wait six to nine months, that's a completely different story. So this is a team approach. I got my sperm sparkle maker doctor that helps me, which is also known as a male fertility specialist. And then you got me and then we got the patient and we talk as a team and come up with a really good plan in a case like that. Um, next question, if the antral follicle count ultrasound showed a cyst after retrieval, can we do receptiva DX in the same cycle or wait one cycle and go on birth control pill and do the receptiva DX in the next cycle? So here's the deal. Seven days after the retrieval, you can do the receptiva test, whether there's a cyst or not. As long as you're about a week after ovulation, the receptiva results should be still pretty accurate for you. Um, next question, do you recommend waiting to transfer any length of time after getting a second COVID vaccine? The answer is yes, at least seven days. And the reason is that vaccine can cause irritation, inflammation on that arm. It can hurt so bad. It can affect your sleep. It can cause a low grade fever for some people, which I think you should all treat with Tylenol, but I don't want that interrupt with your transfer success. So that's my recommendation. Um, next question, what's your thoughts on HCG wash and intralipids prior to transfer? And I do not do the HCG wash and I don't offer intralipids. However, if a patient wants them, I'll talk to them about why they want them and they still really want them. I'm happy to do it for them. But HCG wash, I don't find to be particularly helpful in my, um, for my patients, but doesn't mean that in your doctor's hands, it's not a good thing. I'm just sharing what my experience has been with the HCG wash. And as far as intralipid infusion, I say just go to Jamba Juice and drink that wonderful whey protein and get that protein in. I'm just kidding, but not kidding. Basically, intralipids is just an egg yolk smoothie 
um, just concentrated, uh, you know, egg yolk in your IV over the course of two hours for a whopping price of $800. So when it comes to testing stuff like that and doing the infusions, again, if a patient wants it, I will offer it to her, but I will not offer it to patients as a diagnostic test or treatment as part of the fertility checklist. You guys don't hear me talk about the tushy with an I method, right? There's no intralipids in there, and I rarely talk about it unless someone asks me. Um, someone's asking, uh, what time of the month will you recommend PRP? So I don't recommend PRP. There are great doctors out there like Dr. Murphy with, I think it's rejuvenatingfertilitycenter.com in New York. He would be a good guy to talk to about that. When should you expect a period after a luteal phase cycle? Sometimes you can actually get a period while you're in the cycle. Um, and then usually you get a cycle maybe a week after the retrieval. Could one blocked fallopian tube affect implantation? The answer is yes. A blocked fallopian tube, especially if it has fluid in it, like a hydrosalpines can affect implantation. Otherwise, just a blocked fallopian tube, no inflammation, no endometriosis, shouldn't, uh, should rarely block implantation. What's the chance of a good embryo at 44? And have you worked with patients that are 44 with an AMH of 1.4 and 10 eggs? And how many times would I need to do IVF? How do I get a consultation? So um, the way you would do it is go to dramy.org, my website, and there's a schedule a consult page and you just click on it, put your information in, and my new patient coordinator will reach out to you. It's so hard because at 44, you can even do six cycles and still not get one healthy embryo. But if anyone has a chance, it's someone who's 44 with a follicle count of 10 and an AMH over one. So that's really exciting. I really hope that I can help you. Next question is, how long does it take to get a consultation with your clinic and how do I reach you to set up appointment? Thanks, much appreciated. So if you're really nice, I'm just kidding. Um, everyone's really nice. So right now we're looking about a, about four weeks or so to get into for a consultation. Once you're in though, there's no wait list for treatment. Once you're in, you're in, you're in the club, you're VIP. Next question, when you talk about riding the egg wave, is that cycle to cycle or do the waves last for several cycles? So it's basically moment to moment. So it's like your period starts, you're looking at that wave of eggs coming in. The way you look is on ultrasound. And then if you're like, don't like the wave, I actually wait until right after ovulation and then I look again. And I'm like, how many eggs do I see coming in? Do I like it? And I'm like, oh yes, we got like eight this time. We're gonna ride that wave. Does that make sense? Something that I do. In patients who are cycling regularly, in patients who aren't cycling regularly, it doesn't matter. You can just wait, look for it, don't like it, wait a week, look for it, like it, don't like it, go on from there. What would you tell your sister or friend the night before their second frozen embryo transfer? First one failed. So I would say, look, you got this. You did everything that you can in your control to give yourself the best chance of pregnancy. Now let the rest of it go. You just got to let it go and just know that if this embryo was meant to be, it will be. And if it doesn't work, it is not your fault. There's nothing that you could have done better. Trust in the doctor, trust in the embryologist, trust in science, and get a good night's sleep and watch something wicked funny after your transfer. And then call me so I can tell you funny things. Like, actually, there are things that I would love to say, but I can't. I have a wicked sense of humor. Okay. Hi, Dr. Amy. Is assisted hatching harmful to the embryo and could lead to birth defects? And I have not seen that it be harmful to embryos, and I haven't seen that it leads to birth defects. Um, I hope you answered my question from your webpage. I really want to hear your opinion. Any special considerations for a 40-year-old with an AMH of 3.6, antral follicle count of 18 for their first IVF cycle? Yes. I'm not sure how old your husband is, assuming you have a husband. And remember, you don't need a man to have a baby, okay? But if you do, make sure his sperm is sparkling too. Um, I would talk to your doctor about your IVF pyramid, how many eggs they expect, have you done all the right preparation? What protocol are they using for you? Why or why not? What medications are they using? And then have you built your fertility team? Go to fertilityteam.com and you'll learn more about what I'm saying. Next question is, what is your opinion on BMI and IVF? Some places have generic cutoffs. So there is a cutoff in my IVF lab, not mine, I don't own one, in the IVF labs that I use, and that's a cutoff of 40. But certainly there are other centers that have higher cutoffs. So if I have a patient that's over 40 who still needs to do IVF, I know where their centers are, and I refer them there because I want them to get the help they need because I don't want them to wait too long if that can potentially affect their egg quality. Someone's asking, do you recommend taking ProGraph? And I do not. Can you suggest a fertility doctor in LA? Absolutely. I love Dr. Catherine DeOgarte. I love Dr. Guyana Bertsumian. I love Dr. Um, Kashani. 
I love, there's so many doctors in LA, you guys. They're all my friends. I went to UCLA, so I feel like I know almost all the doctors in LA. So you really can't go wrong. I love Dr. John Norian. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So Dr. Wambach, um, next question. Any recommendations for an RE in the Boston area? Absolutely. So I love Dr. Allison Diamond. She's with CCRM. I love Dr. Rita Sneeringer. She's with Boston IVF. I love, love Dr. David Riley, also with Boston IVF. Um, again, like you, there's so many awesome doctors in Boston as well. And I also trained in Boston. So I feel like I know so many of them and they're all my friends and I know they're extremely caring, compassionate and empathetic and they do a really good job and they're wicked smart and they talk like that too. I'm just kidding. They don't talk like that. Okay, guys. Oh my gosh. Now you guys are all talking to me about doctors like San Diego, Dallas. Holy smokes. You guys, you probably don't know this. I have no sense of direction. I barely know how to get home from work. So my favorite doctor in San Diego, there's so many, Dr. Alex Kwas and Dr. Saeed Danishmand. Those guys are rock stars. Um, in Dallas, again, I have such a hard time with um, Texas. And what I mean by that is Dallas, Austin, Houston, I'm telling you, literally, like, it's, it's pretty, um, I'm pretty famous for having no sense of direction. In Dallas, I love Dr. Dorette Norhassen. I love Dr. Ravi Gada. See, I'm doing a good job. Again, you can't go wrong in Texas either as a fertility patient. You have so many options. You guys, I love you. Thank you for being here. This is my heart beating for each and every one of you. Remember to fly the rest of this week. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by flying, I mean, oh my God, did I forget what it means? First, love yourself. You guys are worth it. Stand up for yourselves. Remember to always ask questions, never apologize for them, and keep asking until you have the answers. You deserve it. I love you all. Have a great night, and I'll see you guys soon. And please keep flying.